But to introduce Dr. Tinji is Dr. Catherine Burt. Uh, Dr. Burt is a board member with Glaucoma Research Society of Canada and vice chair uh, of its uh, scientific advisory committee. Um, she's a glaucoma specialist, a professor with the Department of Ophthalmology and Vision Sciences at the University of Toronto, and a staff physician at the Department of Ophthalmology and Vision Sciences at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre in Toronto. Um, here is Dr. Burt. Sorry, I just needed to spotlight her there. Thank you so much for your patience. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the time spent here this evening. Take it away, Dr. Burt. Thanks, Suzanne. I uh, appreciate the, uh, the introduction and, and the chance to in turn introduce my colleague and good friend, Dr. David Tingey. He's a glaucoma specialist in London, Ontario, Canada. He obtained his MD in 1985 at Western University and went on to complete residency training in ophthalmology at Western University in 1989. Following that, he completed a two-year fellowship in glaucoma at Harvard University in Boston, Massachusetts. Since 1991, he's been on the faculty of the Thulek School of Medicine in the Department of Ophthalmology, Western University, where he holds the rank of associate professor. His practice primarily involves the diagnosis and treatment of glaucoma. Dr. Tinji has a few hobbies, but his primary extracurricular hobby involves enjoying the company of his seven children and five grandchildren, which keeps him pretty busy. Two of his children are family doctors in London, Ontario. Uh, that is just a brief uh, summary of Dr. Tinji's illustrious career. And I'm grateful that he was able to take time out to join us tonight. I'll turn the, the session over to you, David. Thank you, Katie. And it's really a delight to be here. Uh, I was asked uh, by the Glaucoma Research Society of Canada to give this address. And uh, I accepted without hesitation because I knew I'd be uh, interacting with patients actually. And I thought, what should I really talk about? And, you know, I've been in practice now for about 32 years. And I, I really feel, you know, as you know, for most people, glaucoma is a chronic affliction. And uh, after about 32 years, I really feel I've been on a journey and my patients have been on a journey. And what I wanted to try and um, share with you is, is really the fact that we're on this journey together. And I think what I'd like to do is really address for you uh, what glaucoma is and look at it from that perspective uh, in terms of past, uh, present, and future. And then hopefully myself and other panel members can answer some uh, questions you might have about uh, glaucoma treatment in that context. So the journey of glaucoma, where have we been? Where are we now in 2023? And interestingly, where are we going in the future? But I think before we look at that, we really have to kind of look at what is glaucoma. Now, we, we obviously have a mixed audience here. Some of you will be very familiar with what glaucoma is, but other individuals might, be, might not be all that familiar with glaucoma. So I'm going to talk a bit about what is glaucoma um, and also how do we treat glaucoma? And then how, in the end, we'll look at how can you as a patient with glaucoma, what can you do to try and preserve your vision if you're affected by glaucoma. So, you know, when I started training in the 1980s, I kind of thought glaucoma was pretty straightforward. You, you treated patients with eye drops or laser or surgery. Uh, you lowered their eye pressure and that was all there was to it. But, you know, as Albert Einstein said, the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. And that is really part of what attracted me to glaucoma. There's a lot of mystery around why people get glaucoma, what gives them glaucoma. Uh, and I think as we unravel that ball of yarn, I think new treatments are going to appear that we haven't even really thought of yet in terms of managing this disease. So I'm just going to go back to our high school 
biology textbook. And, and what I've got here for you is a very simple diagram of eye anatomy. And I'm going to try and explain to you uh, what glaucoma really is. And I think if you think of the eye as a camera, let's think of it as the TV camera, and then the brain is the TV station. And we really have to get the, the visual signal to go from the eye to the brain. So the eye really does function much like a camera. Focusing of light occurs at the front of the eye. There's a, a clear dome called the cornea, and then behind the pupil is the lens. And then these structures focus light onto the retina. So the, the eye is hollow, but it's filled with, a clear, with clear fluid. And the inner lining of the back of the eye lines the eye much like wallpaper in your living room. But that structure is called the retina, and it's very much like the film in the back of a camera. Now, that retina has lots of tiny cells, and there's one particular cell called the ganglion cell. There's about a million ganglion cells in the retina. And what seems to happen is that these ganglion cells just drop out one by one. Now, the ganglion cells all have a long tail we call an axon, and they, they each individual cell uh, connects to the brain via this nerve at the back of the eye called the optic nerve. So the optic nerve is really a bundle of about a million of these tiny little nerve fibers that go from the ganglion cell. So what happens is the ganglion cells gradually drop out and then the optic nerve appearance changes and that eventually has an effect on our vision. Now, we can diagnose glaucoma just by looking at the optic nerve usually. In fact, I could probably show any of our panelists a picture of an optic nerve and they could, most in most patients, they could pretty well look at it and say whether a patient has glaucoma or not. And this is what goes on when you visit your eye care professional, when he shines a light and looks in the back of your eye, or if he, take, he or she takes a picture of the back of the eye, what they're looking at is the optic nerve. And it's very much similar to looking through someone this picture window uh, of the or the window of their living room from outside and looking into the living room and looking at a picture hanging on the back wall. So on your left, you'll see a picture of an optic nerve that looks quite healthy. And you'll see that optic nerve looks sort of pink and fluffy. And it has a little depression in the middle right here called the optic cup. And usually the optic cup is fairly small. Now, if we look at the image on your right, you'll see that this nerve has a very large cup and it's not quite as pink and fluffy. The nerve fibers are kind of withering away and we call this cupping. And that's really characteristic of glaucoma. And that's really how we define glaucoma. Now, when you're in your healthcare practitioner's office, you'll often hear them talking about eye pressure and lowering eye pressure. And that certainly is the mainstay of treating glaucoma. But interestingly, uh, pressure isn't even really part of the definition. And the reason for that is that a, a, some, a good number of patients can have normal pressure with glaucoma. The majority of glaucoma patients have high pressure, but some patients actually have normal pressure in their eye. And uh, yet we lower pressure in patients to treat the glaucoma. And the reason we do that is that we we know that lowering pressure, even if it's not high to begin with, seems to slow down the progression of glaucoma in patients. We all need pressure in our eye. The eye is like a ball. It's like a basketball. It needs to have shape. And it's actually miraculous that the eye can actually maintain a normal pressure in most individuals. But in some individuals, the pressure goes high, and this is a risk factor for glaucoma. And we know that lowering pressure slows down or stops the progression of glaucoma. Now, what we are also interested in is not just what does the optic nerve look like, but how is this affecting a patient's vision? We refer to glaucoma as the silent thief of vision because it can begin to affect your vision and you can't even tell it's happening. And this is much different than most other eye diseases. If you get a retinal detachment, if you get macular degeneration, if you get a cataract, you're on the phone right away because you know there's your vision isn't right. 
And yet with glaucoma, you might have it for a few years and not be aware that it's slowly nibbling away at the ed edges of your vision. So we need to measure the edges of your vision. And we do that with a machine called a perimeter. It's a test called a visual field test, or as I like to refer to it with my patients, the torture test, because a lot of patients don't like doing this. It can be a little bit tedious. It can take a while to do, and it really requires a lot of concentration. You can't let your mind wander and wonder, gee, what's for dinner tonight? You really have to focus. So even though we recognize it, it's really not necessarily a fun test to do. It's really important in terms of, of tracking vision loss, which this is all about. And I'll, I'll just give you an example of, of what we see in terms of the results of this test. So here we uh, is a diagram labeled A, B, C, D. And these are a visual field tests of the same eye over many years, showing how glaucoma can affect the vision. So if we look at A, this is a really a normal visual field. And we see where these two lines cross in the middle is the center part of your vision. That's the part of vision you would use to see detail, to read a sign, to watch television, to read a book. If we look to the left, there's a, a dark area here, and this is called uh, the, the blind spot, which we all have. That's where the optic nerve plugs into the back of the eye. This is an entirely normal visual field. Well, let's say this, this patient develops glaucoma, and it's a few years until they go for an eye exam, and then they do another visual field test, and, and now we start to notice a darkening of the vision in toward the nose, maybe up toward the eyelid. And this is a sign of early vision damage from glaucoma. And again, this patient might not even be aware that they're developing vision loss. They may not know they have glaucoma. And in fact, it's estimated that about 50% of the people in the world right now that have glaucoma don't know they have it. They may have mild pressure elevation in their eye or they may not, but they may be developing this change in their vision and they may not notice this. And this is why we really emphasize that people should go for a regular eye exam. And particularly, that, that's really the mantra with World Glaucoma Awareness Week, which we're in now. We, we really want to get the message out there that it's important that people go for regular eye tests so this can be detected early. It's always a tragedy when we say somebody that, that may have had glaucoma for years and they've got lots of vision loss, uh, before they're even diagnosed, because it's all about early um, treatment to prevent advanced loss. If we look now at figure C, we can see now that the glaucoma has gotten worse and it's encroaching on the central part of the vision. And this indeed might get to a point where the patient does start to notice a disturbance in their vision. And this, this uh, ultimately can have major impacts on their quality of life and their ability to see and navigate. And then finally in D, we can see quite advanced loss where the patient now just has a little island in the middle part of their vision. It's like walking around and looking through a straw. So that this patient could still see, still may be able to see even small letters on the eye chart, but in terms of navigating and getting around in life, this can be really detrimental. They're not able to drive, they can fall and harm themselves, on streets, uh, they can walk out in front of traffic. And uh, so it really is a tremendous burden on quality of life. And this can even progress on from that where they lose the center part of their vision. So we're all about early treatment, early detection, uh, because we can't reverse these changes once they occur. So how do we treat glaucoma? Well, as I mentioned, the goal of treatment is really to slow down or arrest the progression of, of vision loss. Currently, the main thrust of this treatment has been directed at lowering eye pressure. And we do that because we know it works. We know that lowering intraocular pressure, as we call it, will um, slow down or arrest the progression of this problem. And we have about three main methods of doing this. One is the use of medications, principally as eye drops. The second is the use of laser to lower eye pressure, and finally, the use of surgery. And we're, I'm just going to look at each of these treatment methods and try and look at them from the 
perspective of past, present, and exciting future developments. So to understand how medications work, we again have to look at our, our basic eye diagram. And as I said earlier, it's really a miracle that most people walk around with uh, normal pressure. Normal pressure is, has an average value of about 16. Most people lie between a number of, between 10 and 21. Well, how does the eye do that? Well, if we look inside the eye, there's a structure called the ciliary body. And this has cells on it that constantly produce a clear water-like fluid called aqueous humor. And this fluid then tracks through the pupil and then escapes the eye through a very thin little drain called the trabecular meshwork. And this is where the colored part of the eye meets the clear part of the eye. And these are in a perfect balance in most people. We do know that as people get get older, the drain of the eye doesn't work as efficiently. So even age can be a risk factor for pressure going up and subsequently causing glaucoma. In addition, there uh, are types of glaucoma where the colored part of the eye, the iris, gets stuck in the drain. And we call that angle closure glaucoma. And that as well can be a cause of pressure going up. Nonetheless, you, as you can imagine, medica medications are designed to either slow the pump down, slow the cells down from producing that clear fluid or assist fluid from getting out of the eye. Now, when I started uh, training in the late 1980s, life was pretty simple in, in a way. We had about three classes of drops we used. We had pilocarpine, which is on your left. It tends to have a green top and it's been around since the 1870s. Not used a lot now, it does tend to have a fair number of side effects in terms of blurring of vision, but it still does help some patients and I still have some patients on it. In the middle category uh, were drops like propene and epinephrine agents. These are gone now, we don't use these anymore. They had a significant number of undesirable side effects and there are newer drugs that have replaced them. And then on the right was Timolol, which uh, really came on the scene around 1980. And actually, a lot of the early research on this drug came out of Montreal. Um, and Timolol is still widely used. It's tolerated very well by many patients. Some patients are unable to use it, uh, but you'll find it uh, either alone or in combination with other medications still in use today. Now, as I said, life was simple back then, but life has gotten very complicated. In the 1990s, we had the advent of a whole bunch of new classes of medications, and we've really welcomed these medications, more tools in our toolbox to help patients and more choices for patients. So in that sense, it's been very helpful, and this certainly has helped to avoid or delay more aggressive intervention in patients. But on the other hand, you can appreciate that this also can add quite a burden in terms of therapy. You can imagine, I do meet patients that have five different bottles in their medicine cabinet, and they feel like they're constantly putting drops in to try and control their eye pressure. So although these are helpful in lowering pressure, administering so many drops can certainly have a bit of a negative effect on quality of life. And certainly for us as, as physicians, it can get very complicated in terms of switching adding, dropping medications. So um, this has added a, a whole other dimension in terms of treatment. And I think the future of medications is going to perhaps try and alleviate this burden a little bit. And, and I'll give you some examples uh, if we look into the future. For example, bimatoprost, which is a, available as an eye drop, is now being investigated as a slow release medication uh, known as Bimatopros SR. And this involves a uh, relatively minor office procedure where a tiny needle is used to inject a little implant. So in the center image, you can see a tiny needle going through the clear part of the eye. This is the injector on your left. And you can see how tiny this implant is compared to a coin. And this implant is just injected and it settles into the bottom of the front of the eye. And the idea is this would release medication and give months of pressure control without patients having to remember eye drops, to run to their pharmacy to get more eye drops, 
or to suffer any surface irritation from eye drops. So this is still in its infancy, but it, it gives you an idea as to how uh, industry is thinking of ways to improve quality of life while delivering the drug in a very consistent, effective manner, and really removing that burden of perhaps forgetting your eye drops, which can have negative impact. Here's another almost space age concept along the same line. This is a very uh, new uh, development, but a company called Spyglass Pharma is looking at uh, a repository of this same medication attached to a lens implant. So what you see here is a lens implant you would receive during cataract surgery, which involves replacing your cloudy lens with a new lens. And then attached to this is a, a repository of this drug. And this company is hoping to give patients several years of pressure control by doing this. So whether this will come to fruition and be commonplace, I don't know, but it just gives you an idea of how technology is advancing and looking for alternative ways to kind of free up patients from the burden of remembering to use eye drops all the time. The other avenue, which is quite exciting, is to look at other ways of treating glaucoma other than just lowering eye pressure. We know that eye pressure is a risk factor for glaucoma, but it's not the whole picture. Some people can have high pressure in their eye and they never get glaucoma. Other people have normal pressure and they do develop glaucoma. So there's something more in the mix. And so again, researchers are really looking at Maybe if we could protect those ganglion cells, if we could protect the optic nerve in the back of the eye, maybe we could prevent vision loss uh, in ways other than just lowering pressure. So I, I just have this slide up to show you that, that this is really a hot topic in research and people are really looking at medications, a pill you might take, uh, some sort of supplement that protects the optic nerve and again, prevents vision loss. So th this is quite exciting for the future of glaucoma treatment. Now we'll talk a little bit about lasers. I mentioned lasers can be treated to lower eye pressure. And I have seen some exciting changes in this realm as well. So a very common way of lowering eye pressure with a laser is a procedure called a trabeculoplasty. Just takes a couple of minutes to do. It can be done in the office. No anesthetic is required other than a few freezing drops. And you just sit up to this laser and the, your ophthalmologist places a lens right on the surface of your eye. So this laser is targeting the drain of the eye at the front of the eye to try and get it to work better. And the way this works is the laser releases very gentle packets of energy that tickle the cells that line the drain of your eye. It doesn't burn a hole in the eye. It doesn't cause any uh, cooking sounds or even visible scarring of the drain, but it seems to tickle those cells and they wake up and do a little bit of housekeeping. And the changes I've seen over the years with, with this laser treatment are first of all, the development of a very, a gentler form of the laser that, as I said, doesn't even leave any burn marks. And it seems that it can be repeated in some patients. In addition, we've moved the laser treatment up in our treatment algorithm. So we used to reserve this type of laser for later in the disease. But now this is a laser we know can be offered as a first line treatment for some patients. And again, that can often, if they have just mild pressure elevation, it can lower their pressure without them having to be burdened with eye drops. It may not last forever, but if it can be treated, it can give patients years of pressure control. In addition, for patients that are already on drops, if their pressure starts to sneak up, we can do this in the office quite simply. It's a low risk, high yield procedure that can lower pressure and again, protect the vision. Now, we also have lasers that work on trying to slow down the pump, those cells that are producing fluid, and we refer to this as cyclophotocoagulation, which is really a mouthful. But this, and again, we've seen a lot of 
technological change over the years. So this type of procedure used to be really only reserved for eyes that really had little to no vision and extremely high pressure. And it certainly still is used in that context. But with the refinement of laser, with gentler, more precise applications of the laser, we're now seeing this laser used earlier in glaucoma. Um, and again, I think as this evolves, this will be another toolbox that can be used early and earlier. But it is, it's a, a heavier laser than, than the, the laser trabeculoplasty I showed you. It requires freezing of the eye with a needle, and it can be a bit painful for a day or two afterwards. Uh, but I think, again, this is a welcome tool in our toolbox. So on your left, you can see this laser, how it presses up, up against the wall of the eye. And the wavelength of the laser is cleverly designed so that it doesn't really burn the outside of the eye, but it's picked up by the cells that pump fluid inside the eye, and they are selectively burned and produce less fluid. And on your right, you can actually see this being applied in the clinical situation. So we'll go on to glaucoma surgery. And again, this is a very um, fast changing environment, I would say, and, and quite exciting, I think, uh, looking into the future. Now we have some gold standards as far as glaucoma surgery goes, and that would be the trabeculectomy and the tube shunt. And these are still widely performed. And generally these are surgeries that are performed on patients who we can't control with drops or laser. So not everybody with glaucoma needs glaucoma surgery. Indeed, many patients do not require this. But if they get in a situation where they just can't be controlled by other means, this is a welcome addition to try and control their pressure. Trabecu I'll just Trabeculectomy involves uh, making a tiny window uh, where the clear part of the eye meets the white part of the eye and allowing fluid to seep out of the eye by making a little channel. And then the fluid seeps out under the tissue that covers the white part of the eye. This is done under the eyelid. It has to be done in the operating room. It takes about 20 or 30 minutes to do. And it's not without risk. You can have significant complications, but fortunately they're very rare. And certainly this is vision saving surgery for some patients. If a trabeculectomy doesn't work, or if it, we feel it won't work, we can do a tube shunt, which involves placing a tiny tube in the front of the eye and routing it to a little reservoir we put at the back of the eye. And these are both still very commonly done glaucoma surgeries. But we've always pined for a surgery that's a little gentler, a little lower risk, one that perhaps might have a niche between laser and these more aggressive surgeries. And, and this seems to be on the horizon now. And I call this MIGS madness, this slide. But what I'm trying to demonstrate with this slide is we have all sorts of new devices in the pipeline that offer surgical alternatives for patients. MIGS is an acronym for minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. And the idea is that these surgeries are a little less invasive than the previous surgeries I showed you and are another means of controlling pressure. So these might involve placing tiny stents into the drain of the eye, the trabecular meshwork, as you can see here, or placing a tiny tube that goes from the front chamber of the eye under the conjunctiva, which is an outer layer of the eye. So these are all welcome additions. Some of them don't really move the needle that much in terms of pressure control, but can certainly reduce the burden of drops and can reduce eye pressure, but may not have quite the robust pressure lowering we would see with our conventional surgeries as trabeculectomy. But believe me, this is just a small window into what's coming down the pipeline. And there are certainly many more developments occurring in this space. So this is exciting for the future. And I think all of, all of what we've seen here is really going to change the complexion of, of how glaucoma is treated in the future. 
So that being said, you know, glaucoma really is a journey. It's a journey that patients are on, but it's also a journey that we take with our patients. And I really want to emphasize that glaucoma is much more than just treating a patient, a client, or a number. I've found that over my 32 years, I've really gotten to know many patients very well, and I almost feel like I'm their family doctor sometime. It's very much about treating a, a person who is burdened with a chronic affliction. And one term I really liked, I think this was coined by our colleague Kareem Damji, um, is the biopsychosocial spiritual considerations in individual patients. In other words, we really have to have a holistic approach when we're, when we're following patients over their arc of life in terms of what's best for them and what their wishes are as well as what our wishes are. Certainly the ultimate goal is both preventing vision loss and blindness, but it's also about improving quality of life by allowing individuals to live with this chronic condition and allowing them to have some input into ter in terms of what therapy is best for them. And I think that's really the true art of, of medicine and of treating glaucoma is selecting the appropriate treatment for each person. What's good for one person might not be so good for the other. And I think that's the challenges we really face day to day when we're, we're dealing with individual patients. Uh, the future of glaucoma treatment, I think is quite exciting. I think what we're going to see is earlier laser and these gentler surgical interventions to reduce the burden of drop therapy. So we're not needing patients that are carrying around a bag of five drops all the time. I think we're, we are going to see treatments directed at protecting nerves, so-called neural protection. And who knows, we may see regenerative technology someday that can restore this vision loss. The, uh, certainly, there's a lot of research looking at stem cell therapy and other nerve regenerative therapies. You know, if you think uh, an amphibian can have their tail cut off and they grow a new tail with all new nerves, but humans can't seem to do this. But believe me, there's a lot of research being directed that way. And that's why we need to support uh, research societies like Glaucoma Research Society of Canada to, to spur on more discoveries that will someday perhaps allow us to actually regenerate vision loss. I think genetics is also a really exciting uh, field, both in terms of early detection. If, if you can get a genetic test early in the game that will tell you that you're at risk for glaucoma and you need to be screened, that's a way of preventing vision loss. And maybe in the future with things like CRISPR therapy, which I know very little bit about, but we may be able to manipulate genetics in, in at-risk individuals to really um, reverse the whole process. But that's getting almost into science fiction, but not so much fiction anymore. I guess I would also add the, the development of, of AI or artificial intelligence. I think these will could also have potential positive benefits in terms of monitoring and treating patients in the future. So finally, what can you do to protect your vision if you've got glaucoma? Well, one thing I would really emphasize is maintaining regular appointments with your eye care provider. You know, as I pointed out earlier, often when you have early vision loss in glaucoma, you're not aware of it. So often your agenda is different than the ophthalmologist's. And I, I see this particularly in younger patients, because as you know, when you're young, you kind of feel bulletproof, but it, it's kind of a hard pill to swallow. If you feel you can see fine, your vision's 20-20, and yet the ophthalmologist is telling you, boy, you have to use these drops and you have to keep coming back for appointments. But that in the end really pays off for patients if they can do that. So keeping appointments, using medications as prescribed, but I think also taking good care of your physical health, it all ties in. I, I think in some ways, glaucoma is a little bit of a me metabolic disease in some people. It's linked with some other metabolic issues. And I think if you can really just take care of your physical health, and that means getting adequate sleep, eating a proper diet, 
and trying to avoid stress in your life. I think those can all have positive benefits. And also taking good care of your mental health. And you, you know, just receiving a diagnosis of glaucoma can have a negative effect on your mental health. And here's a, just an interesting little tidbit. It's even been shown that the practice of meditation can lower intraocular pressure. I speculate that that may be through re reducing stress hormones, hard to say. But it just, to me, emphasizes how taking care of your overall health can have a benefit for glaucoma patients. I think the other thing is, though, to try and advocate for glau glaucoma care at both the local, provincial, and national levels. And, you know, I always say glaucoma is the, always the bridesmaid, never the bride. I think if you asked some politicians, what's an ophthalmologist, they might say, well, they're kind of like a dentist, but they take out cataracts. But the majority, and I, I certainly take out cataracts, but the majority of my time is spent trying to protect vision in people afflicted with glaucoma. And I think we really need to aware, to raise glaucoma awareness. And I think, you know, International Glaucoma Week is one way of doing that. And I think also supporting glaucoma research, particularly, you know, we, we've got the Glaucoma Research of Society of Canada here, which was a brainchild of Dr. Graham Trope, which he thought of several decades ago, and he's really helped support awareness of glaucoma and allowed glaucoma research in Canada to flourish. And we need to continue to grow this and, and see more and more uh, breakthroughs for our patients that are affected by glaucoma. So that's a little bit of an overview of um, glaucoma past, present, and future. It's a huge topic. We could talk forever, but uh, it's been a real pleasure um, chatting with you. And I'll, I'll turn it over to our moderator now. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks, Dave. Um, this is uh, Dr. Binlish, and I'm just going to lead a little bit of a question and answer. Um, it's 7.38, and uh, we would like to finish the webinar by 8 o'clock. Uh, so I apologize if we don't get to your question. Um, there's questions, as I've been watching, are slowly filtering in. Um, some of the questions, perhaps, if we don't get to them, we can answer um, at a later date. Um, the first question I'm going to pose to um, to Dave. Uh, this came in a, a few days before from a uh, patient, and just in a logist of it. Uh, so this is a situation where a patient has elevated eye pressure, a narrow angle, has had some treatment with an iridotomy, and uh, is on eye drops. But there's always a concern that uh, their family doctor, or nurse practitioner, wants to prescribe a medication that um, conflicts with glaucoma. And uh, this obviously worries the patient. Um, they refuse to take the medication. So how best can we address this concern? Thanks, Raj. This is a, a question we get constantly, and it, it, it can be a little bit of an, an annoyance for us, for family doctors and for patients. So, and it is a bit of a catch-22. So the concern is there are some medications that can, for example, dilate the pupil a little bit. And if you have narrow angle glaucoma, that can be a risk for causing an acute closing of the drain where the pressure goes up. So this, the, the thing is, if you know that you've got narrow angles and you've had laser iridotomies, then that in general, will eliminate that risk from occurring in the majority of patients. So for most patients that have had iridotomies, they can go right ahead and take that medication. It's quite commonly seen, for example, for bladder medications, some antidepressants, uh, medications in that, that category. So the, the patients that are probably at most risk for that are patients that have narrow angle glaucoma or the potential for narrow angle glaucoma, but they don't know they have it. So and I've seen that patients that get do get put on a systemic medication and they get thrown into angle closure glaucoma. But if you've had an iridotomy, uh, you will 
it's very unlikely that you'll go into angle closure glaucoma. Now, some patients will are concerned that, well, what if my iridotomy closes? Well, that was more of an issue years ago when argon laser was used for iridotomies. But it, I mean, it's almost never happens with our, our current laser modalities. Okay, that's great. Uh, great answer, Dave. I just put one more uh, push to um, uh, cataract surgery, I guess, if you've had a narrow angle and you've had cataract surgery, um, that will also uh, lessen the chance of a medication affecting your glaucoma. Uh, the, other, uh, the only other thing to think about, if you need systemic prednisone or other forms of steroid, uh, that has a risk of raising the eye pressure, especially if you have an underlying tendency to open angle glaucoma. Yes. Usually the need for the prednisone is such that that has to take priority. And it just means you need to get your eye checked a little bit more frequently. Yeah. And I would, I would just always say to any patient, if you are concerned, check with your, uh, your eye care professional first before you uh, start any of these medications. Okay. So we'll start to with some, boy, a lot of questions are starting to filter in. So um, next question would be, is it usual to have only one eye affected with glaucoma and uh, should you put drops in the other eye nonetheless? So I'll pose that one to Cindy. Cindy, do you mind answering that one? Yes. Well, thank you. First of all, Dave, thanks for the great presentation. Um, you inspired me as well as everybody else. The thing about glaucoma is there's more than one type of glaucoma. There's many glaucomas. We can divide them as primary and secondary glaucomas, open and closed angle glaucomas. Most primary open angle glaucomas tend to be bilateral, both eyes, although sometimes they can affect one eye asymmetrically more than the other. But some of the secondary glaucomas, which means they're secondary to something else, they can be unilateral because whatever that is causing the pressure to go up may be only affecting the eye. We have something called pseudo exfoliation. And I think someone had a question about that. It's related to inheriting a gene called the lysyl oxidase gene that may show up first of all in one eye and not the other. We have um, inflammation that can affect the eye either due to a, a virus infection in the past, which may affect one eye. So there are reasons why one eye could be asymmetrically affected more than the other. Dr. Burt mentioned prednisone. Maybe there is a reason why you've been putting a prednisone or a steroid cream around one eye more than the other, and that eye will be more affected. So because there's many different types of glaucomas, it's possible for one eye to be affected more so than the other, and sometimes only one eye. And then Dr. Tinji mentioned and um, Dr. Vinlish mentioned, there's the so-called closed angle glaucoma. Maybe it's a person who didn't have the prophylactic laser iridotomies and one eye again went into angle closure, what we call subacutely, where the patient may not have realized they're having little intermittent attacks. So it is definitely possible to have one eye more than the other. Great question. Are you protected by, um, by putting drops in another eye, even if your eye care professional says you don't have the glaucoma there? Um, I say yes and no. Sometimes I say to my patients, especially if the eye drop has a side effect, like making the eyelashes long, I sometimes say, you know what, because of the side effect, you might treat one and protect the other, especially if it's an asymmetrical type of glaucoma where both eyes may be inevitably affected. So again, you try not to over medicate people when they don't need it. Um, but there's some instances where putting the eye drop in the other eye may not hurt. Um, and it really is, it's a conversation with your eye care professional. I think as Dr. Burt and everyone mentioned, regular checkups, regular checkups, monitor what you're doing, monitor the pressure lowering effect, monitoring if both eyes are now starting to get glaucoma and keeping an eye on the side effects. Okay, thank you, Cindy. Uh, great response. Um, I'm going to pose this question to Katie, Dr. Burt. My mother has glaucoma and has been recently diagnosed with ALS. Some of the ALS treatments can worsen glaucoma. Has there been any research being done on how other diseases impact glaucoma? And they understand it's a broad topic. So if, if you could answer as best you can, Katie, that would be great. Yeah, um, so my sympathy about the ALS, that's a horrible thing to have to live with. Um, 
there's a lot of interaction between the rest of the body and the eye. But I don't think there is specific research about any one disease. Uh, we know that there are some, sorry, the cat is my mental health medication, but she's a little needy right now. Um, so, uh, so some diseases are seen more frequently in glaucoma, such as diabetes and, and high blood pressure and so on. Uh, but I don't think there is specific research about some of these other less common ones. Um, generally, we'd look at the medication someone was on um, and try and, and treat based on the type and stage of the glaucoma in the setting of the entire patient's quality of life. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Katie. Um, here's a question for uh, Dave. Um, if you get the spyglass implant, uh, do you need your cataracts replaced every two years? Well, you know, that is an excellent question because that's exactly what I thought when I saw that. So generally, you know, when you have cataract surgery, it's good for life. It's not like hips. If you get your hip replaced and you're 45 years old, they'll say, boy, in about 15 years, you might have to have that hip done again. But generally, we view cataract surgery as a one-time thing. So that, I think, is a little bit of a limitation of the spyglass in the sense that you could have it implanted, and let's say it controlled your pressure for three years. Well, that's great. Three years is great. But if you're going to live another 20 years, what do you do after that? So generally, we would not recommend going in and removing a lens implant because you can get into the weeds pretty quickly and cause more problems than benefit. But, you know, the, and I'm just thinking out loud here, but if I was designing this, I'd think, well, gee, is there any way you could fill up that reservoir again and give them another three years with a tiny little needle or something without having to obviously take the whole lens out and put a new one in? So, you know, I really showed that just as an example of how people are really thinking outside the box in terms of giving us other options with medications. And, you know, the other thing, I, I can even remember um, seeing somebody from the in industry talking about an implant attached to, to your cataract lens that would measure pressure and it would use sunlight to recharge its battery. So the, this is almost getting into science fiction, really, but but that's a great question. Okay, great, Dave, thank you. Um, this is actually a, a really good question and um, maybe I'll get Dave to answer it because he's the king of traps. Katie's the queen as well, so both of them. After trabeculectomy surgery, there are many, there may be some scarring of the bleb. What adjustment procedures uh, are there to deal with the scarring? So maybe we'll start with Katie and then Dave can uh, uh, give a little bit more insight. Okay, so the first thing is we try and prevent it uh, by good surgical technique and using uh, prednisone eye drops afterwards. Um, sometimes you need to increase the flow to keep the scar soft. So we would cut stitches using a laser just to melt the stitches in the deep layer of the surgery. Uh, if the scar kind of sets in too much, then it's possible to break it down and soften it by injecting some uh, medication. Uh, they're derived from, from cancer medications, but they're not, you know, we're not using it for that. We're trying to prevent the scar tissue from, from forming um, and to keep it from, uh, and if it does form, to sort of stop it and, and break it down a little bit. And that's uh, done by either a medication at the time of surgery, which is just part of the operation, uh, or uh, one or two different medications can be injected into the scar as a very minor procedure uh, subsequently. David, take it from there. Yeah, I think uh, I would echo all of those points. And uh, we, we refer to that injection as needling, where we can inject medication to try and uh, prevent and break down scar tissue. And we can also use the needle to mechanically open things up. And then sometimes on rare occasions, we'll, we can even go back to the operating room and sneak inside the bleb and try and uh, break down scar tissue with tiny scissors. Uh, but th this is a challenge for us. Uh, some people are much more prone to scarring than other people. And it, it's quite disappointing when you do a perfect operation and then mother nature 
comes along and decides that you're not going to win. And, and can I just add one thing that has been supported by the Glaucoma Research Society of Canada is innovation in the area of uh, controlling the scarring. Just recently, the GRSC um, has supported grants that have looked at ways, better ways to modulate the scarring, because as Dr. Chenji suggested, some patients scar very aggressively, but there's also occasionally patients who don't heal up quite enough, and they actually end up having very low pressures, which the eye doesn't necessarily um, like and appreciate. So one of the um, areas of active research is modulating that scar tissue after the surgery to prolong the, uh, the life of and the success of the glaucoma operation. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. That was a, a great discussion. Um, obviously, um, for us as glaucoma specialists, we're always trying to improve our surgical techniques. Um, so, uh, so the uh, whatever surgery we do has a has a prolonged effect. Uh, here's a good question with regard to uh, patients uh, with glaucoma: Can they practice yoga or any other sports and exercise? Um, Cindy, do you have a quick answer for that one? A yeah, quick answer: There's actually been a lot of research in this um, topic, and the answer is. But basically, being in a lot of downward dog positions where your head's below your heart can put people at risk. But again, Dr. Tinge, you mentioned health-related quality of life. Yoga is very good for you, for your stress. So bottom line is you can pro probably practice yoga, but you have to make sure you're compliant with what your eye doctor tells you. Go to your appointments, have your visual field tests, have your nerve looked at, take your medications and be monitored. So overall, I think your health-related quality of life is important. If yoga is part of that, keep doing it, but make sure you go for your regular eye checkups um, as scheduled. Okay, the only thing I would add, which uh, I think Dr. Tinji taught me this, was those patients who play wind instruments. Mm -hmm. So if you, uh, if you are a musician and you like to uh, play uh, wind in instruments and stuff like that, you should be a little bit careful because that can cause a, a fair bit of uh, a pressure um, around your eye. Uh, a question, when is laser surgery preferred to eye drops and when is a good time to switch? Um, Katie, can you answer that one, please? Well, you can use laser, uh, I think Dr. Tenji mentioned at almost any stage in the treatment. It can be your very first choice with no drops at all. Uh, if one drop is working, but not quite enough, you could add a bit of laser and that may just bring the, the pressure down to where you want it. If drops work, but aren't tolerable, you're getting allergies or side effects, then you can replace a drop with a laser. And then there are the more advanced forms of laser, which you, you tend to use in more advanced forms of glaucoma. So like almost everything we do in this business, it depends. You have to look at the individual patient. There isn't a, a formula that we apply um, sort of regardless, you, you have to really match what you're doing to the needs of that individual patient. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough goal to decide. And um, you mean, trying to pick one treatment for that patient is sometimes can be a little bit more challenging. Um, Dave, I'm going to put you on the spot for this one. I think it's a okay. good question. But um, what does Dr. Tinji think? I would think it's they've talked about MIGS therapy because it's microcurrent therapy. So I'm assuming they're talking about MIGS. So what's your opinion on MIGS? Well, you know, as I said, MIGS is, is welcome because although, you know, we do a lot of trabeculectomies and they're great, they're hard work, they're fairly invasive and they're not without risk. So we've, we've been looking for simple, less invasive procedures to help control pressure. I think there, there's two drawbacks with MIGS. One is they, a lot of them don't really move the needle a lot in terms of pressure. They get you a little bit of pressure lowering or they might let you get rid of one medication. And the other is they're prohibitively expensive right now. And in our medical environment, it's, it's a challenge getting them into the mainstream for patients because we can't ask patients to pay for them. They're, they're pro prohibitively expensive. And there's always a little bit of pushback in terms of uh, hospitals, hospital funding, because they might argue, well, 
this costs a lot, is it really doing that much? But nonetheless, I have no doubt that they're going to continue to expand in terms of uh, their use. And, you know, from a quality of life point of view, again, if it can reduce the burden of medications, I think it's welcome. But, you know, it's a very confusing field right now. There's a lot. The thing is, it's very easy to get a device to market. And there's a lot of devices that are appearing on the horizon. And I think all of us are kind of waiting for the dust to settle in that regard. Yeah, and it's it's one of those. And some people, the procedure works very well. In others, it doesn't. Um, surgical technique is very important. And um, that's uh, sometimes why when we say it didn't work, it might be more related to the technique as opposed to the actual device. Um, this, I think, is a really good question. I'm going to give this to Cindy. Um, have you heard about more about insulin treatment that's reversed visual field loss? This was discovered by Dr. DiPolo in Montreal. Yes, no, that is certainly a treatment that has actually gone um, maybe even beyond the research realm. It's interesting because as I mentioned with my other question, there's there's probably more than one type of glaucoma. And I know some of the questions have, have um, risen about this whole entity of normal pressure glaucoma, highlighting that glaucoma really is a nerve disease and not really a pressure disease and maybe lowering the pressure, which we know is an effective treatment, um, needs something else to kind of neuroprotect. So, so yes, and the whole idea there is that insulin has some perputative neuroprotective effects, and it may be in some patients having um, a benefit. Um, I don't know strongly. It certainly, I don't think at this point, nobody really knows what causes glaucoma. Nobody knows what how to really cure glaucoma. And we keep um, searching for that golden grail of um, a neuroprotective agent that would make those retinal ganglion cells that Dr. Chinji talked about resistant to either high pressure or low pressure. So yes, it's out there. The research done by Dr. DiPolo is outstanding. She's internationally acclaimed for her research that she does. And it's maybe one of those promising elements that may in some patients have a benefit, may not. So I think time will tell. And it's, again, the area of research, the type of things that the Glaucoma Research Society of Canada supports, and um, exciting to know that this might be part of the solution. Thank you, Cindy. Um, this question always comes up, so I'll just quickly answer it. It's, it's THC and cannabis as recognized the means of reducing eye pressure. Um, so uh, right now, the position by the Canadian Ophthalmologic Society and the Canadian Glaucoma Society is that we do not recommend the use of uh, cannabis, whether that be um, the THC component or the um, uh, C, I can't remember the other one, but there's two components to cannabis. One CBD. is, pardon? CBD. CBD. So CBD is more for pain control. We thought that may help lower pressure, but it doesn't. It's actually the THC and the THC is actually what gives you the psychogenic effects of cannabis. So because of that, we don't recommend uh, using uh, cannabis uh, as a means to um, reduce eye pressure. Um, I think we're gonna wrap it up here at 7.59. There are still a, a fair number of questions and um, maybe, maybe uh, some of us can address some of them. Um, as, as we were answering questions, more and more uh, kept coming in. Uh, and it's always going to be very hard to answer everybody's questions. So I'd like to stop there. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Tinji for his excellent presentation. Um, I just remember as a, uh, as a early glaucoma person, someone to always look up to. It was always Dr. Tinji. He gave the best advice possible. Um, and he always encouraged us as junior glaucoma people to keep going, never get rattled, never get phased. Um, he's like a real rock in the glaucoma community. And um, he's just been a great mentor to, uh, to all of us. Um, so thanks for this great presentation. Um, it, was, uh, it was amazing. And I hopefully in, informed all of our uh, attendees. And we had a record number of attendees. They stayed right to the end. Um, in terms of uh, giving you an overview of glaucoma. Uh, lastly, I just like to reiterate something Dr. Tinji said is that there are new treatments on the horizon and that is the future of glaucoma care. 
but those new horizons and new treatments, we don't know what they are. And we really need your help in supporting the Glaucoma Research Society of Canada, because those funds help researchers like Dr. Hutnick, like Dr. Tingey, like Dr. Burt, find these treatments. And they can be anywhere from simple things like medications. Uh, there's always a lot of questions about stem cell research and you could be funding projects like that. So please give your support. And we look forward to uh, you joining our next uh, webinar, um, which would likely be next year during World Glaucoma Week. And we ask you to tune in as well to our annual supporters meeting in the fall, um, where we'll have another uh, glaucoma presentation. So thank you all. And with that, uh, enjoy uh, uh, hopefully an early spring if we can get that to that. Thank you.